All right, great. It is noon in Cambridge. And so that means good afternoon or perhaps good morning or even good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this edition of PON Live. Today, the program on negotiation together with Harvard Business School is delighted to present this event in celebration of the launch of Decision Leadership, Empowering Others to Make Better Choices, which is the latest work from Don Moore, Professor of Business and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley, and Max Bazerman, Professor of Business at Harvard Business School and Executive Committee member of the Program on Negotiation. This book is launching one week from tomorrow on April 19th, and we're delighted to give you a preview today. This conversation will be moderated uh, by uh, our colleague, also Professor at Harvard Business School and PON Executive Committee member, Deepak Malhotra. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I'm the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. The Program on Negotiation is a consortium of Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Tufts University. And for 40 years now, PON has led the world in research, curriculum development, and executive education trainings related to the fields of negotiation, mediation, and conflict resolution. And today, we're delighted to have expanded our reach with a series of virtual online events such as this one. Today's participants come from all over the world. Thank you for already letting us know in the chat where you're coming from. We are truly honored that you've chosen to spend the next hour with us. The panelists are going to begin uh, with a discussion at the conclusion of which there will be time for questions from our participants. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom that allows others to vote if they have the same question. Of course, if you have a comment at any time, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Furthermore, this talk will be recorded in case you need to drop out early or you have a friend who wasn't able to make it. And in about a week, you'll find it on the PON website. Supporting this event are the fabulous PON staff members, Diane Long and Billy Fairfield. Thanks to them for everything they've done to get us here today. And with that, I am delighted to hand over the virtual Zoom microphone to our three illustrious faculty members. Together, they form a trio of business professors, co-authors, and negotiation and leadership experts. Gentlemen, I am so delighted that you have made the time for us today. Thank you so much. I am looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much, Nicole, and welcome to everybody who's joining us really from all over the world. Already I've seen in the chat people from Milan and Mexico and Lima and Hong Kong and Nigeria and, of course, Boston, Quebec. So this is really wonderful. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for this uh, really nice event. This is a genuine pleasure for me, not only because I love to do things uh, related to PON, the program on negotiation, which is uh, a home for me, but also because I'm getting to do this with two people that I respect a lot and like a lot. Uh, both Max Mazerman and Don Moore are folks that I've known for a little over 20 years uh, when I was at the Kellogg School of Management as a PhD student. Don was a couple of years uh, ahead of me in that program. One of the nicest guys then, one of the nicest guys now and equally brilliant, uh, perhaps more brilliant now than he was back then. Uh, but that's uh, that's just saying uh, something about uh, how much more he's accomplished in those last 20 plus years. Uh, Max also who's a colleague of mine at Harvard Business School, somebody I respect a lot, has been a mentor of mine uh, for many years. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to talk about some of their latest work and hopefully give you some practical insights and ideas right away over the course of this hour, something that you can walk away with when the session is over but also give you some ideas regarding whether or not you might want to read more about this topic. And I would uh, start and end with that idea, which is it's a great book. It's got a lot of good ideas and we're gonna hear some of them now, but if you wanna get the, the whole list of those, you, you might need to, to grab that book. But the point of this session is not to pitch the book, but to actually find a way to share some of those insights for anybody who may never think about this topic again or pick up another book. We wanna make sure you walk away from here with some practical ideas and some insights that will be useful to you on your own journeys uh, as managers, as leaders, as human beings. So with that, uh, let me just ask both Max and Don to uh, introduce themselves. Maybe I'll ask Don to say a few words about you know, who he is and, and what he thinks about a lot and, uh, and Max as well in that order. And then I will start peppering them with questions. And at the end, uh, for the last 15, 20 minutes, we'll take questions from the audience. So if questions start coming to mind, uh, save them up or put them into the, the uh, Q&A function when you get a chance and, uh, and we'll get to it. 
Thanks, Deepak. Um, it is an honor and a delight to be with you today um, and to get the chance to talk about our book and, and some of the ideas in it. Um, uh, I am uh, a researcher and professor at uh, uh, UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business, personally sort of obsessed with the study of confidence and overconfidence. Um, and I'll just note ironically that it seems to be the Berkeley guy who's dressed up more than you two Harvard guys. <laughs> Some of that. Yes, we're a very informal crowd here, Don. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for sharing your, your time with us. Um, I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School, as, as was mentioned, and I've been thinking about and writing about decision-making, negotiation, and ethics for a long time. And this book um, is um, combines a variety of, the, of pieces that I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, and it's certainly organized um, in a way that's quite unique to, um, to our collaboration together. So uh, it's a delight to be here with you, with you and with Don and with Deepak. Great. Well, we're going to get started. Uh, Max, you mentioned, uh, and as, as did you, Don, some of the other work that you do on, on confidence and overconfidence, decision-making, ethics, negotiation. We're going to touch on a lot of those topics as we go through this hour as well, but I want to start with decision-making. The book is called Decision Leadership. And the two of you have also written previously uh, a very best-selling book on managerial decision-making called Judgment and Managerial Decision-Making. It would not be any surprise if many of the people that are joining us have read this book. Uh, and the question I want to start with is what makes this book different from other books that you've written on decision-making? So if somebody has read and, and really taken to heart the, the lessons you talk about in Judgment and Managerial Decision, what does this book add? What makes this different? Where does this take them? You want to go first, Max? No, you go first, Dan. I'll follow. <laughs> um, so this book attempts to take some of the lessons that were in that book, which was more designed as a textbook um, that reviews the, the research literature. And this, uh, this book attempts to package those lessons and make them useful to leaders and would-be leaders interested in facilitating the wise choices of those around them. Um, it integrates as you have already noted, lessons from our broader work uh, that didn't make it into judgment and managerial decision-making, and it updates all of that using the latest insights from the literature. It is less a textbook and much more of a guide to leaders who want to be effective in their work. And I would highlight the last thing Don just said, and that is it's a book about leadership. Um, so our, our prior book that you mentioned, uh, Judgment and Managerial Decision-Making, I think most people would read that as a book about decision-making. This is a book aimed at how to be a better leader um, with a focus on the fact that the thing that leaders can most affect are the decisions of the people who they lead. Um, so I, I would highlight the uniqueness of the focus of the audience on leadership rather than on regular decision, ma decision making. And for us, leaders are different from many other professionals in that the, the title leadership implies that they're affecting other people, that, they're that, that there are followers or are people that the leader leads. And we're interested in the decisions, not just of the leader, but all of those people who are influenced by the leader. So this seems to imply, and you talk a lot about this in the book, the, the sort of responsibility leaders have, uh, not only as making their own decisions, but some responsibility over the decisions that other people might make uh, in the organization or in, in the, uh, the community that they're leaders of. Uh, and, and perhaps this is uh, one of the reasons ethics is a big part of this book. And it struck me uh, from the very beginning of the book, and, and many times as you go through the different chapters, there is a tremendous amount of uh, emphasis on ethics. And I'll just read one uh, quotation, and I'm going to ask you a question about it. You say, uh, great leaders create the norm structures, incentives, and systems that allow their direct reports, their organizations, and the broader stakeholders to make decisions that maximize collective benefit through value creation. And so it really emphasizes the importance of setting the stage, creating the environment in which other people will make these kinds of decisions. But what I want to push on this, is this a definition of leadership or is this a definition of a certain kind of leadership that we might think of as ethical or moral leadership? Is there is there such a thing as being a great leader when you're not thinking about maximizing collective benefit or value creation? Can you still be a, a great leader of some kind, just not a moral leader? Or does leadership 
in, in your view, imply these aspects of collective benefit and value creation? I would say that we see profound risks, moral risks, legal risks, financial risks, and leaders who ignore the ethical implications of their decisions. To pretend that business decisions don't have ethical implication, ethical implications ignores a key dimension on which decisions will be evaluated. Effective leadership must consider the wider consequences of any decision, and that is by definition an ethical consideration. I, I would add to that if, if we just think about some of our the failed leaders of the last decade, whether it's Adam Newman or Elizabeth Holmes or Travis Kalalnik, um, we see people who dramatically influence behavior of others. Um, but in the end, it didn't create net good because their leadership was so devoid of the ethical dimension. So if, if we look at most of the quote that you just said, Deepak, I think that they were meeting most of those words in terms of creating norms and structures that influence other people. Um, but unfortunately, it was not in a positive direction because of the, the missing element um, of thinking about how to help people make ethical decisions that will make society better off. So is, is the ethicality element uh, a greater burden for people that are, quote, leaders than it would be for other decision makers in organizations? Or would you say that, no, everybody should be that way and leaders would be especially uh, need to be reminded of this uh, just because sometimes they might forget? Everybody should be, but, but uh, leaders have a broader set of concerns because it's not just the leader making the decision, but the dozens or hundreds or thousands of other people that they need to think about who will be acting on their behalf um, and with their stamp of uh, approval. And so, so thinking about how do you create systems and environments and cultures and norms um, that will lead to high quality but also ethical decisions is central to the job of a leader. One of the, uh, <clears throat> the more provocative claims I found in the book was about what the real task of leadership is. And, and you make this point that it's not so much about changing hearts and minds as fundamentally just changing what people do. So you can be an effective leader, a great leader even, by nudging the right behavior, by creating the sort of choice architecture and designing systems so that people are just more likely to make the smart and ethical decision, even if they haven't necessarily bought into it. Uh, and, and I struggled with that for a little bit. And, and I thought a lot about that because uh, I understand the value of getting people to do the right thing, but there's sort of a nagging question, a nagging concern that even if it might, might be harder to change hearts and minds, wouldn't it might still be better to be effective at changing hearts and minds so that when you're no longer there or the environment is different or the norms and structures aren't in place, they'll still do the right and smart thing. How, how do you think about this distinction between getting folks to do the right thing versus creating a situation where hearts and minds actually do change? I would say we have nothing against leaders who inspire change by influencing culture, changing how others think and feel. It's great when it works, but as you point out, it's hard. Our book offers more useful tools, more useful in part because they are less costly. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Don. It, it, rather than hearts and minds versus behavior, um, we just think that much of the leadership literature leaves out changing behavior if it doesn't go through hearts and minds and that that's a mistake. Um, I think that leaders should do everything possible to get our society vaccinated. Um, if they do it through changing people's hearts and minds, great. But if that's not going to work, um, I think that they should go with um, with, uh, add up, with uh, strategies that will get the behavior done, um, even if people's hearts and minds aren't changed at, uh, um, at all. So we're completely with you. Um, hearts and minds are great. Um, but let's not miss the opportunities that Thaler and Sunstein in their book Nudge have provided us with an outline of how to get the behavior done, even in those contexts where hearts and minds are a bit difficult. That's a, vaccination is a nice example because you can try to counter all the disinformation that's out there and persuade people of the scientific evidence, 
or you can just make it really convenient for them to get their vaccinations. It's available at their workplaces, at their corner pharmacies, and um, make it easy for people to get their vaccines. That is more likely to be an effective strategy. And, and, uh, and you're right, it is a great example because you can sort of immediately see the societal costs of not doing this behavior. So we can change the behavior, that, that, that's a great thing. Can, can you provide some examples maybe within organizations? So if you're a manager of an organization, a leader of an organization, uh, areas where you might say, you know, these kinds of nudges seem to be more effective than really doing the heavy lifting of trying to change the entire culture of the organization. Well, the famous example comes from Thaler's early work. Um, if we assume that leaders actually care about their employees and that they want them to save for retirement, um, the famous intervention of instead of requiring new employees to sign up for the retirement plan to sort of start off by opting them in, uh, by putting them in the retirement plan and allowing them to opt out, to change the default on what happens if you do nothing, is an obvious example of kind of um, affecting the decisions of others without working through hearts and minds and going directly um, to behavior itself. And there's lots of great work by um, David Labson and others at Harvard, uh, John Bashir's a whole crew of people um, who um, have become experts at the, the various strategies that we can use to solve a societal problem of people under saving for retirement and leaders can so easily have an impact on that kind of um, area. Another example we talk about in the book is uh, um, from Google um, and Je the work of, of Jesse Wisdom, uh, making other choices salient in the cafeteria, putting the fattening desserts in opaque containers at the back of the cafeteria, and thereby reducing the, um, their impulsive selection by uh, Googlers uh, who did not benefit in the long term from those choices. That's a great example as well. Um, although, we are you worried that you've just revealed where all the fatty food is and now? In <laughs> uh, so uh, the fact that you're writing this book and the fact that you're making this distinction and, and clarifying, as you just did, the importance of doing A and B rather than just thinking it's about A and forgetting to do B. Do you think that there is uh, a change that you see in organizations where people are starting to appreciate that? Because the research, uh, you know, the book Nudge came out many years ago, research on behavioral decision making, uh, behavioral economics has been around for now a couple of decades. Do you get the sense that leaders that you run into understand the power of this? Do you still feel like you need to convince them that it works? Or do you just need to remind them to do it or give them examples? What, what is the hole that needs to be filled at this point? Um, as you point out, Deepak, others have gone before us, laying the groundwork uh, and setting the stage for some of the messages we deliver. Um, insofar as they have been effective, we don't have to change hearts and minds. We just have to remind people of the effectiveness of these tools and how to apply them. I, I would also highlight, um, so, so in terms of thinking about the nudge world, of changing people's behavior through small changes in the environment, um, often skipping hearts and minds. You know, I think we see a lot more of that um, in the tech world where all we're doing is changing the online platform or in governments where we're changing forms. In traditional um, brick and mortar businesses where um, human beings are interacting in a fairly traditional way, which seems to be happening less and less in the um, COVID era, um, I think that, um, that, that making small changes um, to change behavior hasn't been fully appreciated. And I think that we're, we're going to see a move over the next decade as the world of behavioral economics moves out of the government and tech worlds into the broader array of businesses. Yeah, and, and to that point, you know, as, as I try to multitask here, as I, as I hear you and also see what's coming in through the chats, uh, most of it is hi, hello, et cetera. But, you know, somebody makes the point that, you know, with globalization and, uh, you know, the diversity of teams and how far people are, and to your point about COVID, it is only going to become harder and harder to truly understand people and know where they're coming from. To be able to, you know, if you want to change someone's heart or mind, you sort of need to understand their heart or mind. 
And, and that's going to be a, maybe a heavier lift as we get more and more socially distant, like physically distant as well. So it seems to be that the tool, the, the, the lever that you're proposing is maybe going to be even more important, more effective as, as we go forward when we're not all sitting in the same room with the same people that we understand for a very, very long time. Uh, it, might, it might actually be better to, to be thinking about these alternative approaches. So, uh, so your, your your comment or the comment that, that you're uh, you're mentioning from chat also kind of highlights one of the dimensions that that we focus on in the book in terms of dealing with um, people who are different, and and one of the um, one of the chapters um, we wrote focuses on the benefit of how to incorporate different views and how the quality of um, integrating multiple views goes up as the diversity of opinions available goes up with it. So as we move to, toward a more and more diverse world, um, where not just your customers are in different places, but your employees are in different places, thinking about how to wisely integrate the different perspectives um, is very much a part of what we focus on in the book. Yeah, and, and, I, and I would imagine that it would go all the way from the beginning to how do you get more voices into the room? How do you motivate those voices to speak up? How do you create an environment where those voices are actually heard? All the way down to how those ideas are actually implemented. And every one of those is probably things that a leader can do. And then you talk about a number of these things in the book, the different things leaders can do to sort of make sure that the environment is such that on every part of this process, throughout this entire funnel, you're nudging and moving things in the right direction rather than having great intentions, but then never actually creating an environment where those great intentions come to fruition. Um, which actually gets me to this uh, other question I wanted to ask, which is as leaders uh, who understand that they don't know everything, we're trying to create organizations that are more effective than they themselves could get them to be. Uh, there's, there's some talk about in, in your book about uh, taking advice. Uh, you know, we often just think about well, leaders, a person who's sort of telling people what to do, but but you emphasize the importance of leaders taking advice from other folks and you, and you give some thoughts and ideas and, 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 and tactics or tools for how to be a better leader from the point of view of advice taking. Can you share uh, one or two of those pieces of advice or more? Yeah, so a, a couple things uh, come to mind for me. First of all, the value of listening to others in order to capitalize on the wisdom of the crowd. In order to do this, leaders need to shut up and listen to what others are saying. And this can be as simple as creating a venue where others register their opinions, maybe as simple as just voting or um, offering an uh, estimate or a prediction in a prediction market. Another way leaders can benefit from taking advice is empowering their critics to help them anticipate the weaknesses in their plans or in their arguments. I mean, we're seeing a, a vivid example now on the world stage. There has been much talk of the way that Vladimir Putin's autocracy has silenced critics and may have blinded him to some of the weaknesses that the war in Ukraine has exposed in the Russian army. That was a great example, Don. Um, so uh, I, I, th I think we're both fascinated by the topic of how do you obtain good advice? How do you integrate good advice? How do you identify when people are biased and giving advice? And this also relates to um, Don's work on confidence and when people trust their own view and when they rely on others. And, and there are a variety of surprising biases that exist in how we use um, the information that other people can provide. And uh, we know that far too often people underweight, underweight the advice of others using some very creative methodologies that, that Don's been involved in. Um, but um, when people are um, feel like they don't know enough, so when a leader doesn't know enough, they too often rely on other people who might not know very much either. Um, and that creates a, 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 a variety of risks. And, and that may well be the case in terms of the uh, Putin story that Don just referred to. You know, I'm reminded of uh, my brother, who's a, who's a physician and, and now a chief medical officer at a hospital. He was talking about how one of the things that they try to encourage in a, in a hospital setting is if there's a surgeon uh, making decisions uh, you know, in, during a surgery, but if somebody thinks something has gone wrong or might be a mistake or something wasn't done properly, they should speak up. 
And often there's this culture that they've tried to sort of instill on people, which is speak up, speak up, speak up. And he talks about an example where a nurse spoke up and said, hey, I think this is wrong. And turns out that the nurse was incorrect and the surgeon had been right all along. And he made the point that that is the most important moment in their journey to make sure that that nurse is rewarded for speaking up, even though they were wrong in that spot. Because if you're right and you reward people for speaking up when you know they get it right, uh, you don't take away the risk of if you're going to get it wrong, you might not speak up. But to find those opportunities to make sure even when somebody ends up being wrong, you weren't supposed to reward them for being right or wrong, but for speaking up. That's what you said you always wanted to do. So you still got to reward the speaking up. And now they're trying to change. And this goes along the lines of what I think you're saying here, which is they're trying to create a culture not of speaking up, but of listening up. Uh, and not just putting all the burden on the people who are supposed to be speaking, but making sure that the leaders, the people in higher status positions are actively listening up rather than just asking people to speak up. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead, Don. Um, I was just going to note uh, how consistent what you're saying is, Deepak, with the cultures of some of today's most successful companies. Netflix and Amazon have attempted to build in both the obligation to speak up and the obligation to listen up into their cultures. And, and I just thought that um, the story about your brother highlighted sort of a core aspect of, of, uh, we, of what we see as the core job of leadership, to figure out how to harness the best information to make, to make the best decision possible over the collectivity of decisions, not just this one specific decision that's currently in front of us. Yeah, and, and uh, related to how to make the right decision, you, you go from talking just about how do we get advice and information from other people, say in the room, to another tool that is in the decision maker, the leader's uh, toolbox, which is experimentation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the role of experimentation? Because there is the, the version of experimentation, which is, I'm not sure whether I should do A or B. Let me run an experiment and figure out whether A works better or B works better before I launch a product or you know, roll out a certain kind of um, uh, approach. Uh, is, is that what we're talking about here? Or are we talking about something else, about like an experimental mindset that leaders should have? You go, Max. So um, uh, we're big fans of an experimental mindset. It, it actually goes, it, 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 it's not the same thing as nudging, but it goes along with nudging that um, in lots of contexts where we're going to change the environment to create better decisions. Um, we often have hints from, existing practice about what will work, but some things don't work in specific contexts. And if you have a company and you have an idea about how to change some behavior um, at your 22 offices across the globe involving millions of customers, um, I think our reaction is, why wouldn't you wanna test a new idea on 10,000 people first um, so that you can actually find what works um, tweak it and make it better over time. Um, I'm stunned by the fact that when I've consulted to um, high level executives who ask my opinion, um, it's easier to convince them that my opinion is good and that they should implement than it is to convince them that my decision, that, that my, my recommendation is probably good and therefore worthwhile testing to make sure it's good. Um, a lot of us don't like the idea um, that the idea that we're about to implement is probably good. We kind of want to assume that it is good and implement. And I think we make far too many mistakes as a result. So we think that, that learning about experimentation, trying things with appropriate measurement um, should be a core aspect of leadership development. Um, we, I, I think our appreciation of experimentation is of a piece with our um, recommendation to listen to advice. Max mentioned the problem of circumstances when the leader doesn't know very much. Um, when you can get advice from the world by running an experiment and getting evidence to inform your position, um, that's a great way to handle a challenging situation in which the leader and his or her advisors don't know the answer. And, and the, tech, the tech world's all over this. So Google now runs 10,000 experiments a year. Um, but I, again, a lot of companies are behind the curve on thinking systematically about how do we learn over time. 
By the way, I'm curious, do you think the tech world is all over this, even in the broader experimental mindset version, or you know, they want to figure out how to best run an ad campaign or how to make sure you sell a product or how do you, where do you put things on, on, a, on a platform? Do you, do you think it's sort of spelled into this mindset that you want? Absolutely. To? Take that as a complete answer. Very interesting. Um, no follow up on that. Uh, this idea that leaders don't know everything, starting from how do you get advice to how do you run experiments uh, gets us into a third category of, hey, leaders, uh, we don't know everything, so let's dot, 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 where you take some time to talk about the role of intuition and perhaps the overemphasis in the broader leadership uh, books and culture around whether or not you should trust your gut, as, uh, as Jack Welch would say, uh, whether you should rely on your intuition. Uh, I probably couldn't even count the number of times I've heard people talk about as leaders, how much they rely on their intuition. It's a very common thing people will say when they're giving a keynote, just off the cuff remarks. Uh, you gotta trust your intuition, you gotta go with your gut, you have a feel for it. But you, you go to some length uh, to express your dismay with that approach to leadership. Can you talk a little bit about why you seem to be anti-intuition? Now I know I'm probably, maybe I'm uh, overstating it, but I don't think by, by too much. I think there's a strong push in the book uh, against relying on intuition. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, we are against intuition. It, it has a place in decision-making. Um, all of us rely on intuition to some extent or other, but it should be part of the picture and not the boss that determines how we make all of our decisions. In the book, we try to be clear about what the evidence says on the weaknesses of intuition. So first of all, um, we identify some of the biases to which intuition is vulnerable, and those have been well documented in decades of research on behavioral decision making in which uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman are, are two of the most important figures. The many things that seem intuitively plausible, that, that feel right, but are predictably in error because they play to our biases, they play to our, um, the, our unique perspectives and experience. The information that's more available leads us to fear flying more than driving, even though driving is objectively more dangerous. Um, and the problem with, one of the problems with relying on this potentially flawed intuition is that you can't audit it. Intuition emerges whole from unconscious processes into which we lack conscious insight. And so when they're biased, it can be hard to identify that. In the book, we try to orient readers, leaders toward the lodestar of effective decision-making, selecting the option with the highest expected value. And when intuition makes it impossible for us to assess expected value because we're relying on uh, subjective impressions uh, that emerge from unconscious processes about valuations or probabilities, it, it complicates our ability to, to do that calculation accurately. Max, what, what else would you say about intuition? So I, I, I wanna highlight that people love the message that you can trust your intuition coming from an authoritative source. And, um, and I think, man, so, so managers hear it and they adopt it and they trust their intuition. When we're not arguing your intuition's lousy, we're just arguing that it isn't as good as your more deliberative thinking. So for important stuff, you want to engage your deliberative thinking. So um, rather than hearing the message, your intuition isn't as good as others, that's not the message. It's that if you think about, if you, the same person, think deliberatively, you're going to do better than if you think intuitively. And there's a sort of lots and lots and lots of evidence to support that claim. Um, it, it's interesting to, um, to be talking to you, Deepak, because... Um, as you know, many of us in our department um, teach uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis as part of our negotiation class. Um, and you really kind of pushed us in that direction. And there isn't a better example imaginable than 60 years ago um, when we were faced with missiles in Cuba and had the U US leaders use their intuitive processes we would have invaded and we would have been hit with nuclear weapons in response. 
Um, thank goodness we found ways to deliberate and deliberate thoroughly rather than trusting our intuition or many of us who are here today on this Zoom wouldn't be around um, to be talking about the issue. Let me just note the particularly problematic nature of successful leaders telling others um, how good their intuition is. So you get to be successful as a leader um, of an organization uh, by being both good at what you do and lucky. So every leader who's honest with themselves acknowledges that they got to be where they are, not just because they're good and hardworking, but also because they're lucky. And if we mistake the role of luck as our own brilliance, it can make all of us in that position um, too confident about the quality of our intuition. All of us deserve to be uh, more humble, more cautious, and more willing to hear criticism about the quality of our intuition. No, I, I really like that clarification uh, from both of you about uh, sort of intra-individual. So not trying to say, hey, your intuition isn't good as that person's analysis. It's that your own analysis and deliberation would make you a better decision maker than merely relying on your own intuition. Uh, is your sense then that intuition is uh, sort of a catch-all for everything inaccessible, maybe experience, et cetera, or is it more dangerous than that? Don, you mentioned, you know, it feels right, but it could be subject to biases. How should we think about our intuition? So when we run out of data, when we've collected as much as we can, when we've sort of gotten to the point where we can't get anything more analytically, and we do sort of feel like there's, the math isn't complete, like we just don't have the right answer, and we're now starting to feel like there's going to be an intuitive piece of it, what might we do at that point? Should we sort of rely on that because it's experience-based and probably useful, or are we in a danger zone? So I'll start by simply saying, use your intuition most of the time on all the unimportant decisions that you make on a regular basis. So which of the two toothpastes in the drawer you're going to brush with today Go with your intuition. Don't spend too much time analyzing it. Uh, when you go to a grocery store, it takes too long to do a cost-benefit analysis on every item. But on the big stuff, deliberate, and not only deliberate, um, deliberate in a way that figures out how to include the, the, the input that you can get from other people. So um, I'm perfectly fine simply not worrying about my decisions for the bottom 95% of my decisions. It's just the important stuff that I want to figure out um, how to get better advice from my friends who know more than I do and how to think um, carefully and not act impulsively. Um, it's the important stuff that I want to get right. And I want to sort of suppress my impulses that might lead me astray as much as possible. And as enthusiastic as we are about the value of deliberation, and computing expected value, running the numbers inevitably exposes the limitations of such rigorous quantitative analysis. And there will come points when you're not sure you've made the probability estimate right. Our goal here is not to give that quantitative analysis um, the uh, soul voice in decision making, but instead to bring the heart and the head into dialogue with one another so that they can each inform a decision, providing those aspects of the decision making process that each one does best. Great. Uh, as we're getting close to uh, the 1240 point, I want to be mindful of the fact that a lot of questions are coming in. I'm going to shift to those in, in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, I'm just going to ask you two, two questions that hopefully will be somewhat, somewhat quick, and then we'll transition to the questions from the audience. And I got a number of these lined up here. Um, the first is, you know, as I go through this book, and as you even introduced yourselves, you talk about previous books and research on uh, being perfectly calibrated when you are uh, making a decision, making sure you're not overly confident. Uh, you've talked about blind spots in, in ethics. You've done work on negotiations. You've done work on manager of decision making. As I think about all the other books you've done, every one of those is sort of in this book. Do you think of this as some sort of a synthesis of all the, where this is where it's brought you to? Or it just so happens that when you start thinking about leadership, a lot of the things that you've worked on just happen to be relevant. I mean, how, how do we think about this? Because to me, knowing both of you 
And knowing the journeys you've been on as academics and as advisors and consultants and teachers, I kind of looked at this book and I said, my God, it's starting to all come together in, in one place. What, what's your sense of, of it? Thanks for noting those common threads. Um, yeah, we, in this book, we wanted to take uh, the best from all of those prior works and package the most useful lessons in this one volume. But I would note that we're too young to just synthesize our stuff over our lifetime. Um, but not so, the grand synthesis. This is the. the sort of this is not a grand. Thing. No, I, I want to highlight the fact that the audience is different. The audience is people who have a job to actively think about, integrate, and influence the decisions of other people. So uh, this book is more about others rather than you making a decision than any of our other books. And I think that that's kind of an important, unique focus. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that comes uh, through loud and clear from everything from the, not that you should judge a book by its cover, but it makes it clear on the cover. But from everything you've said, and the moment you start reading this book, you immediately realize that this is not just about me and my, but we and ours, and the specific responsibility that those with greater either formal or informal uh, leadership capacity can, can really make a difference. And, and here I'll, I'll, I'll sort of emphasize that because as I was reading this, I wasn't actually only thinking about CEOs or a senior vice president or the executive team or the board. The examples make it pretty clear that there's leadership opportunities for people all through organizations and outside of organizations and communities, et cetera. And I think the, a lot of the examples give, give, uh, give a lot of support for that. Amen. Uh, last question before we move to the questions from, from the audience. If you were going to give one sort of final practical piece of advice to the audience as they think of themselves in a leadership capacity, uh, even if it's not a formal role, what, what would be a, a piece of advice you would give to folks that you think might might uh, produce some good returns in the in the long run? Since this is a PON event, um, it seems appropriate to elevate lessons on value creation. Leaders have a special opportunity and a special obligation to create value for a wider set of constituents and interested parties, both inside and outside their organizations. I'll go with, I'll, I'll agree with Don. I like it. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to some questions from the audience. Uh, I will sometimes read it just as it is. Sometimes I might just uh, throw in a few more words just to make sure that uh, I'm interpreting in a certain way that I think uh, it's meant. Uh, the first question that I'm going to touch on here is from uh, from Lars, uh, who says, can it be a trap when empowering others to make better decisions that we influence too much based on our own biases? So here you are trying to cre do the things you've said, so you're bought into that, but we're biased and we're there and we're sort of, are we maybe going to overly influence what comes out of it anyway? I think a good guide, a responsible leader, orients others not toward what they think is right or their own intuitions, but instead toward a guide that is right for that person, helping them think through or establish the expected value of their decision, helping them get better at figuring out how they can make an effect, a more effective decision, helping them get better at making choices consistent with their own values and long-term interests. So, so the idea is, is the role itself is to make sure that they understand that this is a decision within their scope of responsibility, and you're just helping them do their job better, rather than asking for an output that, that's, that's relevant to you. Is yeah. that right? Uh, that? So I think that Lars's, the, Lars's question highlights that there is a risk that I sort of incorporate others. Uh, I, I influence others by the way I present the question to them. And so can a leader bias other people by the way in which they lead? Absolutely. Um, but hopefully our book focuses on how, how does a leader influence others in a way that increases the quality of the decision, not in terms of how to do what the leader wants, uh, might want them to do or might intuitively want them to do. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the session we do on uh, on JFK and, and his leadership there. And, and one of the things that the students note very, very quickly is one of the things JFK would often do when the XCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, was meeting to figure out what to do about the missiles in Cuba. He would often make sure he's not in the room, uh, and he and he makes the point that you know people's people change when when the leader is in the room. They start thinking about what the leader wants to hear, and I think every one of us has noticed when you're sitting around a table. 
and there is the leader, uh, the highest status person, whoever it may be, maybe the CEO, maybe somebody else. When that leader speaks, that leader usually looks at everybody as they're speaking. But when anybody else in the room speaks, they're usually looking right at the leader. And what they're doing there is trying to gauge, what, what is this? Is this going down well with, with the boss? This person nodding along, am I on the right side of this? So sometimes, and it goes back to these little nudges, right? Yeah. You, could, you could say to the organization, hey, listen, don't care about what I'm going to think, you know, like be your own person. But sometimes it's easier to not be in the room, maybe. And, and at the risk of boring the audience with 60-year-old history, the Cuban Missile Crisis is also fascinating because Kennedy's behavior was so different than his behavior during the Bay of Pigs, which had happened a year earlier, when in fact, he did bias people exactly as Lars is implying without the intention of doing so. And as a result, a far worse quality of decision was made. The um, Cuban Missile Crisis analogy for the Netflix organization was back when Reed Hastings, the charismatic and widely beloved CEO of Netflix, had the brilliant idea that he championed enthusiastically within the firm of splitting the DVD and streaming businesses. This is the quickster debacle that almost killed the organization. And it was that lesson that helped develop the culture of criticism and commitment at Netflix, wherein uh, the organization regards it as an obligation to voice your concerns and reservations about something that the organization is going to do. Great. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question from uh, from from the audience, uh, from Philip. Uh, I think it addresses the idea that you know we need to be more deliberate. We need to sort of get it right. We need to experiment, etc. Uh, it says many organizations don't have the patience for the slow and steady progress being advocated. How do we develop an environment that has the patience to allow this philosophy to blossom? Well, what are your thoughts on this? You want to go first, Max? Sure. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to my 95-5 rule instead of an 80-20 rule that a lot of people use. Uh, for 95% for of the decisions, um, I don't think you need to pay that much attention to what we're saying in our book. It's for the 5% where you're making truly important decisions, I think that it's absolutely critical. So you want to identify um, sort of, uh, there, are time that, there are times when people are, are impatient because a decision really has to be made immediately, okay? And um, we don't have time for the full deliberation that, Don, that would make Don and myself happy. Um, so there's a constraint involved. There's other decisions that the costs of the deliberation isn't worth it in terms of the, the decision being made. So we're really after those important decisions where we have the opportunity to deliberate that we wanna create the norm um, not just for patience, but for um, deliberativeness in order to get to the right decision. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be yet one more nudge to leaders to say, you know, make it clear that, you know, you're not advocating a wholesale change. We're going to be an experimenting organization all the time because that might actually give more resistance. But when you clarify for folks that when it, when it comes down to A, B, or C kinds of things, we want to do it this way. For the rest of it, I trust you to do it the way you've always done it it probably is a lot more of a, an easier to accept answer from the, from the people that you're leading. Uh, I wanna move to a question that sort of, I think zooms out a little bit uh, relative to some of the questions I've asked so far, which is uh, from Kathy Fox. And, and uh, Kathy says, you know, how do we address the increasing promotion and admiration for unethical leadership? Uh, you can imagine uh, this might be what we should be doing. Uh, I don't think there's any, uh, uh, she's not saying, well, you know, how, what do you make of it? She says, how do we address the increasing promotion of these? I mean, maybe people just want a strong leader who doesn't look like they're deliberating too much or, or uh, caring about everybody's well-being or uh, experimenting. Maybe there's a different kind of leadership that's, that's admired more. What, what do we make of that? Well, how do we address it? Well, I think that, right, so, so I, I like these mini-series about these bad people in corporate America. So I'm kind of in the middle of a number of them. And, um, and you know, I think that um, th this new version of the mini series focusing on the wrongdoers of our time is actually shockingly helpful. So I think that these, these series focus, uh, focus on people who were viewed as successful leaders, who had admiration. And I think that that's being taken away. And I think society is starting to see 
the harms that are created by having medical technology used on patients that isn't valid, um, by having sort of inappropriate competition because somebody's pricing real estate well below market um, in order to appease the venture capitalist. Um, so we see a variety of um, stories that are highlighting that, that we goofed on the admiration that Kathy is addressing and perhaps moving us toward a more preferred state where we think about how do we create new interventions that make the world a better place as a result. When I think about Uber, um, you know, I'm, I think the, the fact that we've changed our transportation system because Uber and then Lyft led us in the right direction is a great thing. Um, I, I would have been just fine if it took an extra two years for them to do it in a more ethical way along, um, to, to get us there. And, and I think that we're seeing those kinds of stories become clearer. So in the current, um, uh, in Super Pumped, which one of the series that I'm currently watching, you no, know, Lyft is, comes across as a pretty good organization who's accomplishing the same goal as Uber in terms of changing the transportation system without doing some of the, creating some of the harm that we saw through um, Uber engaging in both the illegal and unethical practices. Intensely competitive or partisan situations seem to facilitate the sort of tolerance of unethical leadership, where people look at the unethical leader uh, and say, yeah, he's an SOB, but at least he's our SOB. Um, in our book, um, in encouraging consideration of ethical perspectives on leadership, we um, very intentionally take the broader view that uh, um, rather than think about warring camps in which your goal is to defeat the, the other side, that if um, it, what wise leadership is marked by an attempt to seek the collective benefit, that you're considering the broader implications of your decisions, um, not just for your side and not just trying to win. Great. Uh, I think we have time for at least uh, maybe two more questions. Uh, maybe more, we'll see. Uh, this one comes from... a. Uh, uh, Janetta, uh, how do we encourage leaders to not discount or dismiss input from those less experienced or with limited seniority? And I'm sure there's more people out there with uh, less experience and limited seniority than there are people with maximal seniority. We already talked a little bit about how leaders should listen to everybody, but that's again what we think they should do. And if they're the ones reading this book, great. Uh, what if you're not one of them and uh, you're trying to encourage leaders to do this? Do you just buy them the book and sort of you know, nudge them to read it? Or how do we think about it more globally? How do we think about getting those leaders to, to be more open to this? It's a great question. And it's all about uh, getting people to attend, getting leaders especially to attend to the quality of the arguments that they're hearing and less the status of the person who's making those arguments. Low status people can make powerful, effective, persuasive arguments, and that's when they should win the day. And when uh, powerful, rich, influential people make dumb, vacuous arguments, they do, should not deserve to be influential. So, so uh, at the risk of highlighting a different book, um, Don's book, Perfectly Confident, is all about what, what, what are often overconfident and in many cases, overconfident senior older um, leaders. Um, and um, I think that a lot of us need to learn that there's limits to what we, what, what we do know and to also seek diverse input. And diverse input means not just um, uh, demographics based on gender or ethnicity, but also age. And I think that, um, a wise leader wants to incorporate input from across um, the spectrum of their organization to come up with the best decisions. So um, I, I think that the case can be made to, to leaders that they want to incorporate more junior voices, um, not just because it's nice, but because they can make better decisions as a result. That's great. A uh, question coming from uh, Chastity. Uh, and this, I think, uh, reflects the fact that, you know, people that come to PON come from very different uh, types of organizations and uh, types of experiences. 
Uh, so as I think about innovation and change within the public sector, specifically in public education, there's often an, oh, this isn't possible in this space, or this doesn't apply to us. What uh, particular shifts or challenges do you see in implementing this behavioral approach to decision-making culture that might be different than in the private sector, or, or maybe just broadly speaking, public versus private sector? What do you see the distinctions there when it comes to what you're proposing? Or are they the same because leadership is leadership? So I think one of the interesting um, pieces, um, which I alluded to earlier, um, but the behavioral economics world has perhaps made, ha had a bigger influence in the public sector than in the private sector. So a number of governments starting with um, the UK government and the behavioral insights team started incorporating new ways of thinking about how leaders can influence the decisions of millions of people. Um, I'd say well in advance of mainstream corporate um, America or, or European business. Um, so I, th I think that we have lots of good models for um, innovation and change in um, the public sector. I would emphasize that there's also lots of documentation about how David Halper and the leader of the Behavioral Insights team ran into lots of resistance early on where people were very, very skeptical. And, um, and our colleague, Mike Luca, has done a good job of highlighting how um, the Behavioral Insights team made excellent progress um, by starting with an easy victory and figuring out how to collect more tax revenue first. And after they collected an extra 80, 80 million pounds, now all of a sudden lots of other parts of the UK government were interested in, in this new approach to thinking about leading the decisions of other people. So, uh, so I'm actually kind of quite optimistic that the public sector's doing just fine. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think the tech sector is doing just fine. Um, it's really um, mainstream corporations that aren't in tech that where we need to make the most progress. So uh, I'm gonna just pose the last question before I hand it back off uh, to Nicole to, to, uh, to close the session. Uh, we were joking earlier about, uh, before the session about, you know, who's the target audience for this book? Because publishers always wanna know that before you publish a book and the author always wants to say, well, everybody in the world should read this book. And I think I didn't ask that question up front because uh, it's better for the audience to just listen to everything and then get motivated to, to buy it on their own anyway. But is there a, is there a target who may not realize that they would be a good target audience for this? Is there, are there people out there who might not, maybe they're not on here uh, on, as an audience member because they've made up their own mind, but somebody like, hey, if you're thinking about buying this book for someone, here's somebody you might not have thought about would be the kind of person who should read this book that comes to your mind. Well, I'll make that the last question and then I'll invite Nicole back. Um, at the risk of being the author who says this book is for everybody, I think that the, there are useful lessons here for anyone who, um, finds themselves in uh, positions of authority or who aspires to those positions of authority. And I would also just note the many ways in which we influence those around us, regardless of whether we happen to occupy positions of formal authority, that there are lessons here for those low in ranks in organizations. There are lessons here for how parents can uh, better structure decision-making opportunities for their kids, that uh, there are um, useful insights here that can help all of us get better at making, helping those around us make more, better, more effective decisions. Anybody surrounded by other people. So not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So people who want to be thinking about the decisions of others. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Max and Don, for spending this time with us and for sharing your ideas and this book with, with the world and the people that are on this uh, on this webinar. Pleasure seeing both of you as it is uh, always. Uh, and uh, to those who asked questions that I was unable to get to, that's certainly my fault because there was a lot of questions coming in and some were coming in on chat. Thank you for all the excellent today. questions. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll probably have these questions around. So if Don and Max want to take a look at them anyway, because these are very thought provoking in general. So thank you everybody in the audience. Thank you to Max and Don for your time and Nicole off to you. Thanks Deepak. Thanks so much Deepak and Don and Max. Thanks to you both. What a wonderful uh, session. Um, it's a pleasure to, to introduce the things that will be coming up next for PON. And we have our next event actually this Thursday, um, which is our once a year or once every few years, the program on negotiation gets together to honor a 
Great Negotiator. And the 2022 Great Negotiator will be celebrated on this Thursday, April 14th. It is Christiana Figueres, the Costa Rican diplomat, and really the person who got us to an agreement at the Paris Climate Accords in 2015. So for those of us who are here on campus, there is an actual printed brochure. I just got an advanced copy, so you're seeing it for the first time. But for those of you uh, who will be remote, this event is going to be live streamed, and we'd love to have you join us from 2.30 to 4 this Thursday, honoring Christiana Figueres. That event will likewise be recorded if you're not able to attend on Thursday. Or if you want to come see us in person or online, we are very excited to be reopening up in-person courses. Don mentioned value creation. If that made absolutely no sense to you earlier, uh, we'd love to teach you a little bit about it. If you came to the program on negotiation for the first time, uh, come take a class with us. We're going to be going back uh, to in-person programs in May and all through this fall. Thanks as ever to uh, uh, all of the PON staff. Thanks to Harvard Business School, a great partner for this event. And finally, to all of our speakers, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.